Good morning and welcome to Bridgepoint Online. Happy Mother's Day. My name is Ashley Sears and I am the Director of Women's Ministry. I want to invite you to stick around after the message so you can find out some ways to stay connected with us. But first, I'd love to invite you to join us in a time of worship from your home, whatever that looks like. Sing along, hum along, whatever you want. Well, again, good morning, Bridgepoint. So glad you joined us online today. Why don't you sing with us? Come on. Mother's Day looks a lot different this year. <sighs> Mommy needs a quarantine. And our moms may be spending a lot of time with their kids right now. A lot. Like, so, so much time. And even though they love their kids to the moon and back, Mommy! Where are you going? Sometimes moms need a little alone time. Mommy! 
you know, to recharge. Go talk to Daddy. Daddy! Where are you? But no matter what's happening in the world, their favorite way to spend time is with their family. But now my only when is now and my only when is when I'm by your side. In good times and hard times. Mom! Hi. You're breaking everything! In uncertain times. Thank you, Mom, for making time for us every single day. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I ask that you would watch over us as we go to bed and rest, that you'd speak to us in Bible stories and speak to us in... Um... Hey, welcome everybody. And today is Mother's Day. So for all the moms that are watching, uh, we want to tell you that uh, we love and appreciate you and for those moms that aren't able to join us, hey, we love and appreciate you as well. I thought I'd show you a picture of my mom. So here I am with my mom, and uh, this is my youngest sister, Laura. Now, I'm the oldest in the family, and uh, so there's a little bit of an age gap between myself and Laura. And uh, so when I was growing up, well, really, Laura wasn't around. It was just uh, my mom, my dad, and three brothers. So we lived in a very male-dominated household. And we raised German shepherds when I was growing up. All those German shepherds were male as well. So for, for my mom, I mean, she was outnumbered in a pretty rough, tough household. Um, the three brothers, right? Well, there was one time in church, and from the platform, I can't remember exactly what was going on or what we were doing. I'm sure it was undeserved, but the pastor called us down. He said, I would like those rude, crude, and socially unacceptable love brothers to sit down. Yep, that's the kind of household my mom uh, was a part of. My mom did a lot of doctoring for those three boys. There was no shortage of scrapes and cuts and concussions. All that stuff was in a day's work for her. And now that I'm, well, I'm a little bit older, I look back and kind of feel sorry for her. I mean, she was so outnumbered, but she was really up to the task. And she was probably a lot tougher than all of us combined. I think she lived by this quote. It's not easy being a mother, but if it were easy, fathers would do it. Well, I don't think it's easy being a mom. I really don't think it's easy being a dad. And it wasn't even easy being an Old Testament prophet. One of the great things about the Bible is that it shows people as they are, warts and all, and in the New Testament, James writes about the prophet that we've been looking at, Elijah, and here's what he says. Elijah was as human as we are. And so what the Bible shows us is the ups and the downs, the highlights and the lowlights of Elijah's life. So, Elijah, you know, he's on quite a roll. Over the last Three years, there hasn't been any rain because he told the king three years ago there wouldn't be. Uh, he has been uh, part of what God has been doing in the nation of Israel. God has provided for Elijah miraculously. And just 24 hours ago in the story, Elijah had seen an incredible display of God's power. 
where fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. And it was an absolute incredible victory. And now that all that's passed, I wonder if Elijah's gone, man, I just can't wait to see what's next. And here's what's next. When Ahab, that's the king of Israel, when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel, that's his wife, everything Elijah had done, including the way that he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So, man, here is the report, and here is Jezebel's response. Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you have killed them. Well, I don't know what Elisha was expecting, but probably not that. I see, I, I, I think that maybe Elijah was expecting that after this great victory from God, that uh, there would be a, a revolution and, and Ahab and Jezebel would no longer be king and queen of Israel. Or, or how about repentance and a national revival and none of that happens. The message is a simple one. You got 24 hours to live. So here's Elisha's response. Elisha was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. You see, just in a matter of hours, Elisha went from the highest mountaintop to the lowest valley. Elisha plunges into discouragement and he probably went much deeper than that. He's probably in depression. Now, that word, depression, it's a word that we don't like to talk much about, and especially on Mother's Day. But wow, there's so much pressure on moms. I was listening to a story of, uh, of, of a man and his wife. And they were telling me this story. And they have girls. And so uh, the mom had traveled. And so <clears throat> the dad had fixed the hair of his daughter. And they had come to church. And I got to tell you, as you could probably imagine, it may not have been the best. But what happened was, Everybody kind of talked to the dad and said, man, what a good job you did. Wow, you really tried. And he got a lot of credit for, you know, what had happened. Now, uh, mom, uh, well, she's sitting there with her, you know, arms folded. And here's, here's what she said. She said, you know, if uh, you'd gone out of town, in other words, you know, the dad had gone out of town, and I had fixed our daughter's hair in the same way that you fixed our daughter's hair, I don't think I would have gotten much credit. I think what I would have gotten is a lot of criticism. We all live in a world of high expectations, almost impossible to meet standards, and in a non-stop pace. And moms, man, you have such a great influence on our lives, but it is hard to be a mom. In fact, here's a poem written by a mom. I want you just to read through this, and I wonder if you are, are able to relate to the words of this poem. Now, I don't know if you related to some of the words of that poem or maybe a lot of what that poem said. And, you know, being a mom, so much of it is wonderful 
and joyful and, and parenting is such a blessing. But there is a lot of things that are difficult as well. And I'm sure not saying that uh, all moms or all women are discouraged or depressed. And I'm not saying that all men or parents or dads are discouraged or depressed or really anybody. But what I am saying is this, that there's a lot more of this that goes on than I think we're willing to acknowledge. And I also think that one of the best places to talk about it is here in church. And when it comes to Elisha's life, see, maybe what he's going through, you've been through part of that, or you're going through part of that, or you know someone who's going through it. So in the few minutes that we have together, I just want to talk about this a little bit. I can't possibly cover everything that could be said about this issue, and I'm sure not going to try to say, you know, if you'll just do three easy steps, you'll be fine. But what I do believe is that from this story in Elisha's life, we can learn from it. We might be able to see a few things in Elisha's life and identify those things that are in our lives right now as well. And what will really be helpful is when we see what God's response is to what Elisha is going through. Now, before we dive into this, <clears throat> there are two questions that I hope that you'll keep in the back of your mind as we walk through all of this. In fact, we're going to talk about each one of these questions at the end of each point. Here's the questions. What if this is me? Okay, so I, I, what Elisha's going through is what I'm going through. Or what if this is someone I love and I can see what's going on in their life? How do I come alongside them? How do I help them? So here's where we'll start. We'll just start with some common steps to discouragement or depression in Elisha's life. And we'll look at four of them. Now here's the first one. Our fear short circuits our memory. Now what am I talking about? I, I'm talking about that in the life of Elisha. You know, he heard what Jezebel said. He was afraid and he fled for his life. Now he had a reason to. Uh, Elisha uh, was fearful that what would happen to him is what had happened to some of the other prophets as well. But what also happened in Elisha's life is he, he kind of short-circuited. It's like he, he blew a fuse and he can no longer connect what's happening right now to what had happened just a few days ago. Because a few days ago, uh, he was watching an incredible demonstration of the power of God. Uh, he was in a battle where the odds were 450 to one. Now, this is kind of what we do. In the middle of massive change or in the middle of a personal crisis, well, we allow our fear just to overcome or short circuit our memory and we forget the stories in our past when it comes to God's deliverance, God's power, God's faithfulness. We forget what we have, we've already been through and we just kind of run around with our hair on fire because of what's happening at this moment. That's a common step to discouragement and depression when we don't remember what God has done for us. Here's another one. We withdraw from other people. What we'll find in this story is that, uh, well, Elijah left his servant there and, and then he went on alone. It's really common when we begin to become discouraged or depressed, to isolate ourselves, to decide that we're going to deal with this by ourselves and maybe we can handle it. And even though this servant had been through a lot with him, he just says, all right, just gonna, you just stay over here. I'll take care of it. We withdraw. We begin to withdraw from our family, we can withdraw from our church. And the problem with all of that is that we're not better by ourselves. We're not better because uh, we're isolated. In fact, when we're left to our own thoughts without 
other people helping us think through things, maybe getting their perspective. I mean, we're not, we're not better off. Uh, in fact, uh, when we're in this situation where we're discouraged or depressed, we're probably not even thinking clearly at the time. Here's the next one. We listen nonstop to the news. Here's a quote from this verse about Elijah. He prayed that he might die. Now, he had convinced himself that nothing in his life was going to change. Things were just going to get worse. There was no hope. I mean, does that sound familiar? I, I mean, it has been non-stop over the last few months. If you could just summarize it, I mean, you could almost summarize it as, well, you know, we're just all, all going to die. And, uh, you know, here we find ourselves in stage one of uh, our governor's four-stage plan to reopen Idaho. And, uh, you know, maybe with the coronavirus, we're thinking, okay, you know, maybe uh, we can do a few more things now. In another week, we can do a few more things. And just when things start to settle down just a little bit, then this is what happens. Murder hornets. <laughs> and I, I wonder who named this hornet, right? Murder hornets. Now, I, I don't know if there's someone out there that you're going, you know, hey, what could happen next? There you go. And quit saying that, by the way. Now, murder hornets, eh, I'm not so worried about the murder hornets. Here's what I'm worried about. Oh, yeah, it's the great white wren. That bird, when it gets loose, Oh, that bird's going to cause a lot of damage. And, and if you're not worried about the great white wren, well, how about this? The manslaughter grizzly gator. Well, look, that's really not so serious. And there are serious things to deal with. But can't we use some common sense? Can't we refuse to get caught up in all of this? And let me ask you. I don't care where you get your news from, but when was the last time that you spent two hours either watching or reading the news, and after two hours of that, you felt better? Probably doesn't happen. Here's, here's the fourth one. We keep a pace that we can't sustain. Elijah had fled for his life, traveled all day, and then out of exhaustion, just fell asleep. You know, uh, studies show that uh, exhaustion, when we are physically worn out, that contributes to uh, discouragement and depression. And when we think about moms, wow. Well, moms work outside the house oftentimes and inside the house. And now what's happening is moms, their outside the house work is now inside the work, on top of their inside the workhouse uh, job, and kids need to be homeschooled and all sorts of things. And there's a group of students out there. You're taking online classes and trying to figure that out. Maybe you're working. I mean, there's a lot of people that you are running at 100 miles an hour, and you can do that for a little bit. But there's going to come a time just like a car engine. If you run a car engine at the red line, you can do that for a little bit, but then sooner or later, things blow. And that's what happens. When we, can, we find ourselves at a, a, a place of discouragement or depression for these reasons or, or maybe other reasons. But here's what we also need to look at. Look, how does God respond to Elijah's depression? Does God uh, send an angel to yell at him? Does God send an angel to rebuke him? Does God send an angel to shame him? Or, or send an angel that, you know, kicks him and say, get up, let's go, come on, what's your problem? Well, none of that. And as we look at how God responds to Elijah's depression, let's remember these two questions, Right? What if this is me? And what if this is someone I love? So, how does God respond to Elijah's depression? Let's look at verse 5 and 6. 
Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. And he looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down. This is the very first thing that God does in response to where Elijah's at. And what God does is this. He provides a meal and a nap. Now this may be the verse that some of you have been looking for all of your life. I need a good meal and I need a nap. And you're really not wrong. Every single one of us, we have a a physical side and we have an emotional side and we have a spiritual side. And one of those things is not right, or if one of those things are out of balance, it affects everything. So, I'm a diabetic. And if I don't take care of that, take the medication, and if I don't watch what I eat, the physical side of my blood sugar, whether it's too high or too low, it affects the emotional side of me as well. And if there is something in our lives that's not right physically. Maybe it's because of our diet. Maybe it's because of a lack of sleep. Maybe it's some other known or unknown physical issue. This is the starting place in God's response to Elijah. He wants to take care of him physically. Because if you're not right physically, you won't be right emotionally and you won't be right spiritually. Here's what the angel said. He said, this is too much for you. And it wasn't a rebuke. It was just a statement of fact. The first response from God to Elijah was that God provides Elijah a meal and a nap. So what if this is me? Well, here's some questions. How's my diet? Am I getting enough rest? Have I seen a doctor? Maybe if you're in that place of of discouragement or maybe depression, these are some things to look at. There might be a physical reason, a a brain chemistry reason. Might be a reason why you are feeling like you feel. Have you seen a doctor? Don't put that off. Uh, Maybe you need to look at, you know, how's that diet going? You know, if it's all fast food, that dominoes into every area of our life. Am I getting enough rest? That's just some places to start. What if it uh, is someone that I love and I can see this in them? Well, encourage them without nagging. That's kind of hard to do when it comes to diet and rest and, hey, have you seen a doctor? But, you know, pray that you can navigate that and then maybe provide opportunities. Hey, dads, maybe the one of the best things that you could do for your wife or for the, your, your, you know, your mom of your kids, is maybe you could take the kids out of the house and say, here, you just take these next few hours and you can just have quiet. Take a nap. You know, those kind of things. Just provide whatever opportunities that you can uh, provide. Well, there's another response that God has. Look in verse number nine. It says, then he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel, they have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. So after Elijah talks to the angel of the Lord and tells him all this, then here's the response. God replaces our lies with his truth. Now, this is really important because Elisha and every one of us, we act on what we believe. Our uh, emotional state is often based on what we believe. And so, you know, take a look at, uh, at what he believes. I have zealously served you. Well, now that's true. Okay, how about this next statement? Israel has rejected you. Yep, true. 
Next statement, killed every one of your prophets. Nope, that's not true. That's a false statement. And then the last one, I'm the only one left. That's not true either. But because Elisha believes those things, even those false things, that absolutely uh, guides him in terms of what he is going to do. Now, think about this for a second. Would you name the biggest liar in your life? Who's the biggest liar in your life? Give you a couple seconds. I'll tell you who the biggest liar is in my life. It's me. I'm the biggest liar in my life. Not everything that I feel is true. Not everything that I think is true. Sometimes I might make a decision, uh, and I know it's not right, but I can, get, I can convince myself and I can lie to myself about all sorts of things. So, because my actions are based on what I believe, it's important that I believe the truth. And that's why God wants to make sure that whatever lies that we have grabbed a hold of, they are then replaced by his truth. Now think about this. What if this is me? If you're going, man, I don't know. I wonder if, I, I wonder if I've embraced some lies in my life. There may be some that you are absolutely aware of, and maybe you're going to have to think about it, but here's what will help. Read the Bible. Ugh. I know you're going, uh, yeah, we know. Okay, but are you doing that? How are you renewing your mind by God's word? God's word is truth. And it will filter out those lies. And one of those, one of those lies comes across your thinking. Capture it. Don't dwell on it. Don't play around with it. You know, capture that thought. Submit it to what the word of God says. Submit it to, to what God would tell you to do. And capture that thought. And if you are confused even about what the Bible says and whether what I'm thinking is right or not, well, you can talk to godly people that you trust. They'll help you. They'll help you uh, filter out those lies and replace it with truth. What if you see this in the life of someone you love? Well, listen to what they're saying without lecturing. Wow, is that hard to do? Because as soon as somebody starts saying something that you know is not true, you want to just jump in on that and correct them immediately. And you can study this a little bit for yourself. But what's interesting is that when uh, Elisha is telling this to the angel, the angel doesn't really say anything about it. It's not till a few verses later that the Lord tells Elijah that there are thousands of prophets left. And I wonder if there was just a little bit of time between uh, what Elisha said and what God told him so that Elijah can kind of surface all of that and get it out. Listen without lecturing. Redirect to the truth. Do a Bible study together. You can be very creative and you can do whatever you are allowed to do. And if you're not allowed to do anything at this particular moment, you can sure pray for that person that you love. God replaces our lies with his truth. Now, let's look at this last thing. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. You know what happens? God often speaks the softest when we are at our lowest. You might expect if God shows up that uh, he would be in the wind or the earthquake or the fire. And he's done that before. Elisha has seen that powerful demonstration of God's presence. But this time, 
without the distraction of everything going on, it is the whisper of God's voice that is most powerful and exactly what God needed to communicate to Elijah. Hey, what if you are at your lowest and God is at his softest? Well, here's what you can do. Give yourself a little time. Maybe you're thinking, well, I haven't heard God's voice and I'm waiting. Be patient. Trust in God's love and be ready for your next chance. If it's someone that, uh, that you love, well, what should you do? Uh, be patient and be prayerful. And it may be when they're ready, God has worked in their life and they're now ready to talk. There's nothing more powerful than for you to come alongside them and be present. See, with Elijah's full attention in that uh, gentle whisper, God asked Elijah in verse number 13, said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, God knows, because God knows everything. But what he's wanting Elijah to do is to verbalize why are you here and what are you doing? And Elisha answers in the same way that he had answered before. You know, I'm, I've served you and Israel's rejected you and torn down the altars and I am alone. And okay. But what God tells him over the next seven verses is to get up and go back and step into what God has for him to do. It's now time for Elisha, as he's worked through this time of discouragement and depression, to go back to being the person that God has called him to be, and that is the prophet of God. So think about this. What if God were to ask you the same question? What are you doing here? If you're in that place of discouragement or depression, well, you may not have a great answer for that. But what you might be able to do is take a step. Not a giant leap. Not, not something that, uh, you know, the next minute you're fine. Just a step. What, what is a step that you could take, let's say, by tomorrow evening? Could you take a nap? Could you eat a good meal? Could you reach out to a friend? Maybe you call the doctor and make an appointment. You pick a bi up a Bible study that you uh, left off. You connect with the counselor. There may be all sorts of things that you could do taking the next step. And if you're at a place where you just feel like you can't take that step, then maybe there's someone that could come alongside and they could help you take that next step. This place of discouragement and sometimes depression is a place that most of us, if not all of us, will visit. But it's not a place for us to live. And God didn't give up on Elisha, even when he was by himself, all alone, wishing that God would take his life. God hasn't given up on you. He loves you. He has a purpose for you. And it's important, just as God hasn't given up on you, that you don't give up on yourself. What is one step that you can take? Let's pray. God, we're thankful that you love us. And we're thankful that uh, your word helps us to see us as we really are and helps us in terms of what's the next thing that we can do. And for people that might find themselves in this story, Lord, I pray that they would have the courage, Lord, that they would take a small step in the right direction. If there's someone that, uh, that we know that uh, that's where they are, then Lord, help us to take a step
in the right direction and come alongside and be a help to them in any way that we can. God, thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for the calling that you've placed on our lives. And God, thank you that you love us. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, I don't know if a part of this or a lot of this maybe has uh, spoken to you today. But if you need someone to talk to, you can email me at jeff at bridgepointchurch.com. I'd be more than glad to start uh, a conversation. Or if you would like uh, help in terms of maybe a physical need or uh, a prayer request, then you can text NEXT to this number, 208-826-4433, and we'll be more than glad to be a help in any way that we can. For all the moms that are out there, wow, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for the example that you have given us. We wish that we could celebrate this a little bit differently, but know that we love you. And now, listen to this song, In Christ Alone. alone my hope is found oh he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground all firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still, the wind striving cease. My comfort, my all in all. Oh, here in the love of Christ, I stand. Oh.
Thanks again for joining us online this morning. Like I said, I want to share with you some ways to stay connected. So the first way to do that is to find our online connection card. The link is in the description below. This lets us know you are here and to share any prayer requests you might have. Thanks for doing that. Another way to stay connected is to study God's Word together. So we have two YouVersion reading plans that we are doing. If you would like to sign up and be a part of it with us, please text the word STUDY to 208-826-4433. Our mission at Bridgepoint Church is to meet the needs of our congregation and our community. And it is because of your generous giving that we are able to do that. So thank you. If you would like to support the mission, there are three ways that you could do that. First, you can use the Church Center app on your phone by simply tapping the Give tab. Another way is by going to bridgepointchurch.com forward slash giving. Or if you'd like, you could simply drop a check in the mail to the address on your screen. However you choose to do that, thank you for your faithfulness. Once again, happy Mother's Day. Have a great week. 